Welcome to another How Conversation on Moral Leadership. Today we have with us Ellen Ochoa, who is an astronaut and also the former director of NASA's Johnson Space Center. Uh, Ellen was the first Hispanic director and second woman. It is just an absolute pleasure to have you on with us today. Ellen, welcome. Thank you so much, Dana. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let me just check in first and foremost on how you and your family and life is going during these unprecedented times. Well, thank you for asking, Dana. And, um, you know, I, I feel like one of the fortunate ones. I'm doing fine. My family's doing fine. Uh, I live in Boise, Idaho now. And uh, the work that I do, which is mainly serving on boards and doing some speaking, has transitioned pretty well to, uh, to online. Uh, so I can, I can get my work done and still have the opportunity to take walks along the river here or in the hills, which definitely helps with mental health. <laughs> we can all relate to that and taking some time to stay centered and to stay well, uh, so important. Well, thank you for joining us. I think for our listeners to know, I mean, here we have uh, an astronaut, uh, 1993, right? You uh, were the first Hispanic uh, woman astronaut to go into space and to uh, be on the discovery and have uh, now a thousand hours in space and 41.6 days. Well, and let me also add to that, uh, you are also a STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford, and a physics degree from uh, San Diego State University. And I should also say you have STEAM, you have the arts in there as a flautist. I don't know if I said that correctly, yes. but uh, hopefully you'll touch on that. And you're uh, not only part of being the Stanford uh, Symphony Orchestra, but also taking that talent into space. How is it that you got started on this trailblazing and innovative journey? Well, you know, um, in some ways, it just seems um, a little bit like a random walk. I, I had no idea that's wh where I was headed. Um, I hardly took any science in high school, just biology. And uh, when I started college um, at the local university, San Diego State, I was thinking maybe music, uh, maybe business, um, really didn't have a very good idea. Fortunately, I had taken a lot of math in high school, and I continued to take it in college. And, you know, kind of started to notice um, as I was finishing up the calculus series that, you know, everybody was in there in general because they were taking some kind of engineering or science and this was part of that course. So I actually, I went to talk to a couple different professors. One was in the electrical engineering department and um, he clearly was not at all interested in having me in the department. Um, he said, well, you know, we had a woman come through here once uh, but it's a, it's a really difficult course of study, and I don't know that you'd really be interested in it, which was kind of ironic since I had set up the appointment with him to find out more <laughs> about it. Um, you know, but luckily, I got a very different reception when I went and talked to a physics professor who seemed excited that I was interested in physics, um, told me about some careers, different ways that you could go if you studied physics, which was hugely important because I didn't have any idea, really. And it's pretty hard to think about, you know, studying something if you can't really picture uh, what your future might be. And uh, he, then he did ask about my math background. And when I told him, he was like, well, that's fantastic. You already know the language of physics. And so if you started into studying it, you know, you'd really get to concentrate on the concepts, whereas most people will be trying to learn the concepts and the language simultaneously. And I think you do really well. So, you know, I, I tried physics the next semester and then ended up majoring in it. Well, you have uh, been a trailblazer for so many, and I know you have like at least six schools that are named after you and a lot of an awards, but you're one of the first to talk about those women that have gone before you and to honor them. What are some of the moral leadership qualities that you admire in some of them? Well, um, certainly it was, you know, just this idea that, you know, this doesn't seem radical to me at all, but for some people it is that, 
you know, people should be able to pursue what they're interested in. And it, it shouldn't matter what your gender is or, you know, any of these other things like, you know, racial or ethnic background or, or where you grew up. Um, I certainly um, was motivated by what was happening when I went off to graduate school. Near the end of my first year at Stanford is when the space shuttle flew for the first time. So first of all, it was a very different kind of spacecraft and was going to be participating in, in research in space, which I found really intriguing. And then a couple years later, while I was doing my PhD, Sally Ride flew. So, uh, you know, she had been a physics major like me. She had gone to Stanford, which is where I was. And, you know, I think I really needed to see those connections for it to actually even, you know, form this idea that this was something I could go off and do. You know, many years later, uh, it was on, I was on my third um, space shuttle flight out of four. And uh, it was actually the only flight where there were other women on the crew. And there were three of us, two from NASA, one from the Canadian Space Agency. And over the year before I flew, I had um, been on a presidential commission to celebrate women in American history. And it had been time to celebrate the 150th anniversary of what's really kind of called the first women's rights convention in, in Seneca Halls in 1848. And then the many years since then that still required the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement for the federal government to really open up jobs and for me eventually to become an astronaut. So I got to take um, a flag that the National Women's Party used 100 years ago as they were fighting, fighting for suffrage take it into space with me and the, the two other women crew members and I unfurled it in the middle of the uh, International Space Station, which was just starting to be built then. And to me, that was a great way to honor uh, the women who had come before me, who had really opened doors. And, and, it, and it was really just fighting for the worth uh, you know, of people and the ability to choose uh, the path that you want to take. Well, there is a quote, I think it's a sticker for NASA that says failure is not an option. And there must have been just a amazing pressure on you to not fail. How did you cope with that? Well, you know, you know all throughout school where I was often one of the only women in the class, um, certainly only Hispanic women, uh, you know, I just tried to take things one step at a time. Um, I always worked hard. Uh, I think that was, you know, just something I got from my family. Um, try to take advantage of some of the resources. S certainly in school, you have office hours by professors. You have talking to other students, or once I started work, talking to some of my colleagues. Um, one thing I didn't know very much at that time was about professional societies, like Society of Women Engineers or Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. And that is something now I absolutely suggest that um, students and early career people, um, you know, check out those chapters at their universities or at their workplaces, because that is a place where I think you can find support. Um, but I think part of it also is sort of kind of redefining failure. Uh, you know, um, I put in my application to NASA and a, a couple years later, they did uh, a selection and I got to interview, but I wasn't selected. So sometimes people ask, well, you know, how did you cope with that failure? And I, I, I kind of have this response, which is, you know, I didn't really see it as a failure. I mean, obviously I didn't get selected. I was really disappointed because of how much I wanted to do it. But, you know, I knew the odds were low um, and it didn't make me feel like for some reason, the qualities that I brought were, were not valued. It's just, there were a lot of really good candidates and I had the chance to um, go to Johnson Space Center for the first time to meet other astronauts, to find out about the job, to get some ideas of what might make me a better candidate in the future. So I think those are, those are the things that, um, you know, I tried to bring forward in every job of, you know, what, what can I learn, even if I don't do as well as I want? How do I take advantage of the resources that are available and, and you know, just work hard? Well, you have uh, a message that is translated from K through 12 to CEOs and uh, world leaders. I'm wondering if you would try to summarize, what do you think some of the most key skills are for leaders at all levels to elevate and inspire young talent? 
you know, it's, it's hard to always distill this, but I, I um, do think about we had a kind of a poster and a message that we had at Johnson Space Center for everybody that worked there, government employees and contractors. And it was just called um, JSC, Johnson Space Center, Expected Behaviors. And, and it really, it had five things on it. Be trustworthy, be respectful, be accountable, be open-minded, and be a key player. And that was something that we wanted every single person that worked there to, to demonstrate um, every single day. And it didn't matter if you were a new employee or if you were a, a senior leader there, those were the behaviors that were important and that we really wanted people to demonstrate. So I think that that's something that I would just pass on to young people. Well, you spent a lot of time in, in NASA and the, the culture there is, is quite a culture of innovation. And how would you distill like one leadership skill that you really honed in your time at NASA? Well, so one of the things is there's so many, again, so many things that take your time and attention. Um, you know, how do you prioritize? Yeah, and what is your purpose? And I, I, I kind of point to some of my colleagues in the astronaut office who were from the Marines that they used to tell me, hey, Ellen, there's, there's two things, accomplish the mission and take care of your people. And they're like, you know, we're Marines, just two things. I, you know, we got to make it simple. <laughs> but um, I literally honestly would, would always think about it as you looked at the range of things that you might be working on in a particular day or week or month, um, that it really always came back to that. Now, as you move up into different positions, you have to um, define what accomplishment means a little bit differently. Clearly, when I was an astronaut and I was assigned to a flight, it was very, very clear. <laughs> you know, there were um, priorities for that flight, objectives, and you know, my job was to make sure they got done. When you're director of an entire center that does a whole variety of things, uh, you know, it gets a little more diffuse, and sometimes it's a little harder to say, well, what is it that I specifically am doing? Um, but at that level, you realize, okay, the mission isn't just the programs that we are assigned to today and the skills we need to carry them out. It's thinking about what may be coming 10 years down the road and making sure that we're prepared. You know, are we bringing in people with skills today that we're going to need 10 years from now? Or are we sort of basing it on the past? Are we looking at our facilities? Are we encouraging people to bring in new ideas? Are we forming new partnerships, using new technology? Um, upgrade, you know, changing our processes and procedures. You know, I would tell my folks, if there's any process um, that we do today that we're doing the same way from five years from now, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to retain our leadership role. Other people will absolutely pass us by. So, um, so, you know, just defining your purpose and, and priorities and, and, of course, that focus on the people. Yeah, mission people and, you know, that innovative lens as you're evolving, right, to continually question yes. and change. And, yeah. and yet uh, you also have had to lead during crisis. And I, I hate to take you back to this time, but you were in the Johnson Space Center uh, when the Columbia disaster happened and you had to be hurting personally uh, yourself. How did you uh, lead uh, as a moral leader during those crises times? Well, it, you know, kind of comes back to those two things, accomplish the mission and take care of your people. And I would say the mission at that point was two things. Um, one, we, we still had people in space on the space station, and it was clear we were not going to be able to fly the shuttle for some period of time. We didn't actually even know if we were ever going to fly it again. We had to make sure we were taking care of those people and thinking about how we continued to operate the space station we ended up going from a total of th a crew of three to a crew of two for two or three years because we really couldn't resupply um, any more than that. And then the other part of our mission was uh, we needed to understand what happened, <laughs> you know, both technically and also cult culturally, and then determine what and how to fix, you know, how to mitigate it, what, um, what it would really take for us to fly again. 
and it, it took us two and a half years to get back to flying. And of course, we continued to make changes both to the shuttle itself and to our culture after that. Um, and then in taking care of our families, you know, from the very first moment, um, and you know, fortunately, we do put together contingency plans because we know when you're working human spaceflight, there's always the possibility of something really bad happening. I think one of the hardest things about um, responding to all of that was when the accident investigation report came out. And one of the things they faulted was really the organizational culture. And um, they talked about, uh, you know, uh, we relied too much on past success rather than sound engineering practices. That there were some organizational barriers which prevented effective communication. Um, of critical, you know, safety information, even during the mission. Um, and maybe a, an informal chain of command where some of the decisions were sort of made outside of, um, you know, the processes that we would normally have. And, and it was hard because NASA kind of prided itself on do, doing those things well. And everybody had to realize, uh, you know, we had not done them well. It, and, and that we had some changes that we had to make. And that's why um, con changes continued for a number of years. And, and even to this day, you know, there's a, a safety um, stand down every year. We, we also commemorate the loss of uh, the three crews that we have lost, not only Com Columbia, but Challenger and Apollo 1 with a ceremony in the Astronaut Memorial Grove. The crew families are invited. When we have special events where we talk about lessons learned, um, not only is our workforce invited, but again, the crew families are invited. And you know, for some, it's, it's really too hard for them to participate. But for others, it's actually really important for them to see that we continue to talk about the lessons learned and try to make sure that they stay in our consciousness, that people that have joined you know, the center since that happened, that they are, are taught about these to, to help prevent something in the future. Yeah, you're bringing together really the, the technical piece of it and the, the human piece of it so beautifully. And, you know, you have three patents, uh, at least. <laughs> and patents don't just happen. So there's a lot of science and iterative uh, trial and error and, and failure and, and rebuilding. As you think about that scientific process of coming to have three patents and moral leadership, what are the things that translate uh, from that work to leading uh, as a moral leader? Well, I think one of the most um, important is just being open-minded, right? <laughs> um, you know, so that uh, you're not... Um, you follow the data, um, you look to others and their ideas when, you know, as you are doing your own research or trying to come up with your own new ideas and you're learning from your own experience. And again, I think, I think redefining failure again is important. Certainly in the um, research and development sense, it's an expected part of the process. <laughs> you know? um, you, you didn't get the results you expected. Well, well, what does that mean? Does that mean your hypothesis is incorrect? Does that mean maybe um, the experiment that you design needs to be designed a little bit differently? Um, you know, it's really only failure if you sort of ignore the facts or don't follow up with exploring other causes for, you know, the results that you're getting. Um, I think it, it always gets back to um, being open-minded as well as integrity with, with the data. Yeah, I, I want to come back to that. I said a wow earlier because there's there's such a challenge, isn't there, with right now uh, the eroding trust in science, actually yeah. trust in, in organizations and leadership. And so I guess I wonder in that in that process, how do we rebuild uh, trust in science, in facts, in each other? You know, it it seems like this is sort of the perfect time to do that because it's only through science research that has happened over many, many years that we're developing a vaccine that's going to allow us to, um, to get through this pandemic. And if you look at other issues, um, extreme weather, uh, again, what we know, how we model it, that all comes through science. 
I think to reach people who are really generally, genuinely confused about some of the contradictory information that they see from a variety of sources, it's important to have a source of peer reviewed information that they can trust. And I know, you know, as we think about COVID-19 and the pandemic, there were a lot of headlines that came out. Um, and some of them were about studies um, that um, were preliminary, maybe had not yet been peer reviewed, you know, weren't the kind of um, double blind studies that are really the gold standard for medical research. And it was understandable. People were trying to learn as much as possible, as quickly as possible. And, and I think those details were available if you actually read the article where we'd say, hey, this is preliminary, or we just aggregated data and there wasn't a control. But those details get lost in the headlines, <laughs> you know, and so people would see contradictory things and just kind of throw up their hands and say, oh, well, the scientists don't know what they're talking about. Whereas to me, it was a perfect example of how science is actually carried out you know, where people are trying to ask questions, determine the best way to get answers. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing the scientific uh, approach and looking back even at absolutely. Columbia, right? Absolutely. Some lessons learned there. Yes, absolutely. It's, um, it, it's exactly the same thing. It, it was really seeing science and engineering research um, as it happens, which is, is, is exactly how it goes forward. It's not a perfectly straight line, right? It takes a little bit of twist and turns, but really through the process of continued study, peer review, um, you get to understand, you know, really what the facts are. Yeah. Well, one thing that is um, really unifying, <laughs> since we talked about some eroding trust and restoring trust, is the International Space Station and where, you know, countries are coming together. And what are some of the moral leadership lessons in that kind of an environment, uh, you know, far away in a tight, confined space with multiple cultures and uh, differences among people? You know, it's been so rewarding for me to spend a, a good part of my career on, you know, either designing, um, assembling, or, or operating the International Space Station, something I never imagined when I first joined the Astronaut Corps. I got to be in, you know, pretty much almost at the beginning, not too long after NASA had joined up with the Russian space agency, Roscosmos. They were already, and NASA was already in partnership with, you know, the Europeans, Japanese, and Canadians. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I saw, I, you know, I, I actually negotiated with, with members of the Russian Space Agency on crew issues, you know, how we were going to select multinational crews, how and where we were going to train, in what language, how we were going to operate as a crew on board. And, and clearly, you know, the most important thing was to see things from the other partner's perspective. You know, for Russians, it was really important for NASA to acknowledge their history in long duration space flight, which they had a much more extensive history in that than we did, and to be seen as an equal partner to the US. And for, for the other countries and partners, um, you know, they wanted to um, contribute their own unique um, contributions. They obviously wanted to be able to fly astronauts from their countries, which would really help make their contributions visible to their populations and their government. Um, and fortunately, one of the things that, you know, keeps everybody talking and working well together to this day is, you know, the desire of the operators to keep crew members safe and, and to help them be productive. You know, so it's really about listening, trying to understand what's important to others, um, you know, what information or skills, experiences they bring to the table and, and treating them with respect. That, that's not to say it was, it's easy, it's, it's never been easy, but those are the things that have allowed this strong partnership to continue for well over 25 years. Uh, you've got some uh, real uh, experience in trying to communicate across differences and innovate across differences and, and team <laughs> together, right, across differences. What are some of the sticky situations that you were able to work through uh, with communications, teamwork, and innovation? Well, you know, I, I kind of think I was fortunate enough that on my flights, we didn't have any sort of emergencies, right, that we really had to, to work together. Lots of small little things that went wrong and, and you know, the folks in mission control were, were well able, able to help us with that. 
I did gain a really good perspective after my first couple of flights. Uh, one of the jobs I had in the office was to work in mission control in the position that we call CAPCOM, which is uh, the person who actually talks to astronauts on orbit. Um, and, uh, you know, I actually became a much better astronaut, I think, after that, you know, on my third and fourth flights, because I had a much better idea of how mission control worked, you know, sort of what they had insight into, what they didn't, what they were probably thinking when they asked something. Um, you know, so again, communication is really always key. Um, I, I think it was shortly after I became maybe deputy center director that we did have an issue on a shuttle flight. So this was part of the assembly of the space station. Um, they were uh, un, they were sort of ro um, rolling up one of the um, solar rays and moving it to another location because we were adding to the station and then unfurling it. And it turned out it had gotten caught on something and there was a big rip in the solar ray, which was going to be a huge problem for, you know, supplying power to the station as we move forward. Um, you know, it was a little bit of an, an Apollo 13 moment. It, it wasn't saving the lives of these crew members, but it was really trying to save the life of the space station in, in a way. And, um, you know, they looked at what tools they had on board, came up with an idea to kind of stitch it, almost like sewing it, but only with very large pieces of equipment. And, um, you know, it was just a great example of innovation and teamwork and communications. And it worked to this day, um, that solar array is still working. Well, that's uh, uh, leaving a legacy and an impact and an influence. <laughs> Excellent example, thank you. Uh, so big question, what is the greatest threat, do you think, to our planet right now? Is it global warming? Is it the pandemic? Is it lack of trust in science or lack of moral courage? I mean, what's the greatest threat to our planet from your perspective? Well, in one word, um, humans. <laughs> And, you know, the way I think about it is, it's not actually a threat to our planet. It's a threat to ourselves. You know, our planet was here billions of years before humans. I have no idea, no doubt it will be here billions of years <laughs> um, into the future. The planet's going to survive. It's the humans that aren't going to survive if we don't uh, really pay attention to what is happening on our planet and figure out a way to work together. So I don't know, does it help people to think of it more selfishly that, it, you know, it's really ourselves that we're trying to save and our infrastructure? You know, we have you know, brilliant people who've come up with ways to monitor our planet, to measure changes, use that data to build and improve models, become better at forecasting future changes. So there's no doubt in my mind, we also have the ingenuity to mitigate these changes, to adapt. Um, so it's, it's really more about the collective will and the urgency to do so. And I would say that also encompasses the other things that you mentioned, the trust in science and, and moral courage. That's, that's where it comes in. Hmm. It reminds me of, uh, you know, organizational surveys where the question, the greatest strengths or the greatest weakness and the greatest strength is the leadership. The greatest weakness is the leadership. Exactly. And so maybe, you know, the greatest threat is humanity, but the greatest, you know, hope is humanity. So with that, I guess I'd like to focus on a view that you have shared and it's from space, looking down at the earth and at the planet. And you said it's all one and it's all connected. And you know, to, to see that must be, uh, you know, build humility of just how small we are, but really how vast and connected we are. And I must say it's a little bit hard to keep my concentration because I'm looking out the aft windows at some great views of South America right now. How has that influenced you uh, in, in having that experience and sharing that vision? Well, definitely the whole experience of being in space is humbling. And one thing that I was always very conscious of was that it was only because of thousands of other people that I had made it safely to space in the first place. And clearly I was counting on them as well for, for my own safe return. So um, it, it certainly made me uh, uh, respect uh, the whole team. But at, you know, as you do have this amazing view of the earth, um, you're, orbiting every hour and a half. Um, and you do see, see it as one connected system. 
Um, you know, you can see the oceans and the continent. A um, couple of my flights, we are studying the atmosphere, so very um, conscious of that. And you, you don't see it as these many, many different artificial divisions that humans feel so compelled to create. <laughs> and, you, uh, you know, I, I think it's a wish that um, astronauts have that more people could see it as this uh, whole one connected system. You can't really see the, um, the strife, you know, that you know is actually happening on Earth. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful planet. And uh, we should be able to take care of each other and the planet. And you definitely uh, have that thought when you're looking down on Earth from space. That's fascinating. Well, our, our founder and chairman, uh, Dove Seidman, has the book, How, and we have a moral leadership report, which I know you've reviewed. And, and two of the practices are both um, practicing and demonstrating humility and also seeing the humanity in everyone. And I'm kind of curious if you would talk a little bit about, you know, it's this one, like we're all interconnected and that's very humbling. But then how do you go from that place to actually distinctively seeing the humanity in each person? I, I think part of it is just realizing that every person that is working um, in this great endeavor that I got to be part of human space flight is helping to make it happen. Um, you know, and it, it, it didn't really matter what the position was. You know, I, I used to joke that the government procurement regulations were much harder than rocket science. And, you know, that we depended on people who knew those um, extremely well and could get uh, procure the goods and services that we needed to do our job. So, um, you know, one of the things that I did when I was director at Johnson Space Center is you know, I was talking to some employees at one time and one of them who had been there 20, 25 years said, well, she'd never been in mission control. You know, she worked in, I forget what it was, it, you know, might have been um, human resources or, you know, sort of one of the mission enabling um, areas. And I just, re I just remember thinking, it is so sad that there is anybody who works at Johnson Space Center that doesn't, hasn't been in mission control. And it was clear there was a lot of people. So one of the things we instituted was just the ability um, for supervisors to uh, arrange tours, whether it was, you know, mission control or some of our other astronaut training facilities or out at our aircraft ops division. Um, so that they could feel more a part of the mission. They might work, you know, in a cubicle all day, um, but they were, they were making all of this happen. And we, we wanted to make sure they felt more a part of the mission and that they could, you know, just uh, be excited by some of the things that happen every single day there at Johnson Space Center. Fantastic. To feel a part of that and to see what part they bring to that mission. Right. So that brings us to uh, where we are right now in terms of NASA partnering uh, for space flight with a civilian organization with Elon Musk and SpaceX in, yeah. um, you know, really sending astronauts to space. So how do you see that relationship between a civilian and government agency? What are the pros and cons of now building that same type of, of culture and, and connected influence to uh, impact on our missions to space? Well, yeah, so part of the impetus was, of course, the government is supposed to procure services where they are available commercially. And even though these um, services, which was delivering cargo and now uh, people, to the International Space Station weren't available at the time the contracts were signed, this was definitely seen as a way to accelerate making them available. And of course, uh, a hope was that with commercial competition and the innovation that comes with it, that cost would be less than a government service. Um, and you know, and the company would have spent some of their own capital and development, and then there would be more funding for NASA to move on um, to explore beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, but the risks, which both NASA needs to manage and these companies need to manage is, you know, in some cases, there was no experience in human spaceflight before this, and maybe not a full appreciation of the rigor um, through which it must be conducted through every stage of development. Uh, so, you know, NASA had this job of kind of balancing, um, 
you know, bringing some experience and expertise uh, to the partnership, but also um, not being prescriptives in order to encourage innovation. Uh, and I think as time has gone on that, uh, you know, NASA and these commercial partners have both come to be, uh, come to be more and more appreciative of what each other brought to the table. And it's really evolved to a, a strong partnership as we've really seen this year. Yeah, I mean, culminating in a decade, right, to get to this point. Yes. And it's curious yes. to think about what the future is. Um, a lot of the talk is about colonizing Mars. And I'm just wondering what your thought is, is will that happen? When will that happen? And are you going to volunteer to be a pioneer? <laughs> well, I always tell people, um, we'll travel to Mars when we decide to do it. <laughs> um, you know, sure, there's, there's big and interesting technical and operational challenges, but I don't see there's anything there that's insurmountable. So again, it's really sort of more about collective will. And uh, I guess one of the things that I will have going for me, especially more and more as the years go by, is that um, there will be less risk to me from the radiation environment, because the older you are, the less impact it has on your total lifespan, which is how they measure risk from it. So uh, believe me, when John Glenn went back into space at age 77, like every current and former astronaut thought, that could be me someday. <laughs> well, we hope that that is a thought that you uh, keep entertaining. And we know that your innovation, your trailblazing, your curiosity, and you're embracing that, uh, you know, focus on the mission and always focus on the people and the people will take care of the mission is clearly uh, who you are and how you are as a moral leader. Ellen, I just wanna say thank you so much for sharing your time and, and your uh, wisdom with us about this moral leadership journey. Uh, you do inspire and uh, I'm just so grateful for you. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you, I really enjoyed it.